And, uh, and today's forum and, and the one in February together will be the inspiration for an exhibit that you'll be able to see at Great Lakes Science Center real soon. Um, so without any further ado, we'd like to start off the forum uh, with uh, Mike Shefarenko to start things off. Right, thank you, Dante. I'm Mike Shefarenko. I am the manager of civic engagement, web, and social media here at IdeaStream. And we're very excited to have this second forum uh, with the, the students from University School and other schools that will be participating uh, after the fact, after today when we produce the video. Um, today's forum, as, as Dante explained, uh, is, is really about what are the solutions to this issue, this hot topic of harmful algal blooms, which is affecting not only Lake Erie, but uh, water sources all over the world. And we'll hear about some of that today. Uh, and of course, we do welcome your questions uh, from the students. We hope that you will come to the mic uh, here in between sections, which I will describe in a minute, and ask your questions. As you can tell, you're the only ones here, so we're looking to you to, to ask some good questions here today. Um, so we're going to start in a minute here uh, by asking the panelists to introduce themselves, and I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll give a little bit of context and background for harmful algal blooms just to set the, the tone for today and, and provide some context. Then we'll get into the solutions, who's looking at them, who's working on them, uh, from researchers uh, to city planners, farmers, community members, business community, you know, who's looking at the different solutions. After that, we'll switch over to um, looking at what are the challenges to finding those solutions. So uh, are there scientific challenges? Are there funding challenges? Are there political or bureaucratic challenges that stand in the way of, of finding the solutions? Uh, and then we'll finish off by talking about what's coming in the future. What are some innovations that are being worked on today that we can expect to see in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And also, how can students, since you're the future, how can you be involved? How can you be involved today? How can you be involved in the future as it relates to this issue? So again, in between each section, I'll call for your questions. I hope you are brave enough to come to the mic and ask them, and we look forward to your participation. So we'll start with Kathy. Kathy Lynn is the Sustainable Cleveland Coordinator for the Cleveland uh, Mayor's Office of Sustainability. And we'll ask Kathy, can you please say a little bit about your background and how you got here today? Thanks, Mike. Um, as Mike mentioned, I'm Kathy Lenn. I'm the Sustainable Cleveland Coordinator for the Mayor's Office of Sustainability for the City of Cleveland. Sustainable Cleveland 2019 is Mayor Frank Jackson's 10-year initiative to build a thriving green city on a blue lake. My role as the Sustainable Cleveland Coordinator for the office and also for the program is community outreach and also to work closely and facilitate the work of the many working groups that are formed during our annual summit. Thanks. Great, thank you, Kathy. Next, we have Dr. Jay Martin. He's a professor and faculty lead of the Field of Fawcett Initiative at The Ohio State University. Jay, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, yes, Mike. Uh, as Mike said, I'm a professor at Ohio State University focusing on ecological engineering. In ecological engineering, I merge ecological methods with engineering methods to try to um, answer questions involving harmful algal blooms and water quality. So the engineering methods can tell us about how water flows. Ecological methods can tell us how plants grow, utilize nutrients, how nutrients move across the landscape, and eventually make their way to Lake Erie. So those are the types of things I focus on with my research. In addition to that, I, I am the faculty lead for the Field of Fossa program also the Global Water Institute at Ohio State. And in that role, I, I look across the, the research that Ohio State does, link with other institutions such as Kent State, Case Western, to try to make sure that the research we do at Ohio State really has impacts on the field, on the agricultural fields, and in the lake to make, to make improvements to, so we can have a green city on a blue lake. <laughs> Great. And uh, last but certainly not least, Dr. Joe Ortiz. He's a professor of geology at Kent State University. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, uh, it's good to see my, my colleagues here as well. So uh, I'm, uh, my background is in aquatic biology and oceanography at, uh, uh, at Kent State here. I work on remote sensing applications in order to identify uh, toxic algae and toxins from, uh, from aircraft or uh, remote sensing um, systems. And uh, you know, this is an important way to get at the, uh, the root of this problem, to figure out where these things are developing and monitor them so that we can pinpoint where we need to apply methods to, to try and address. 
Great. Well, thank you all for being here today. So let's start a little bit about the background. And uh, I think we'll pro primarily look to Jay and Joe, but Kathy, weigh in at any point. Uh, the background of the algal blooms, just again to set the context, this is a different group of students than was here last time. Um, what are they? Where do they come from? What causes them? That sort of thing. So either Joe or Jay, you can thumb wrestle for it, whatever. Uh, <laughs> However, whoever wants to start. Great. So uh, uh, these, these harmful algal blooms are actually caused by cyanobacteria, right? So these are single-celled organisms. They have photosynthetic pigments, and so they can synthesize their own food from the nutrients they find in the water. The difficulty that we've run into is that there's lots more nutrients in the water now than would be occurring there if, if we didn't have cities and people living in the area. And so uh, because of that, we end up with this excess growth of, uh, of these organisms, which can lead to a number of problems, right? So um, it can be unsightly in the area. It can clog uh, inlet systems and so on. It can lead to um, uh, taste issues and, uh, and, and cause problems for tourism. Um, if the algae also produces toxins, then it becomes a very serious issue because now we have to deal with the quality of our water and whether it's safe to drink. And so that's the kind of issues that we're trying to deal with today. The latest uh, string of these problems started in the mid-1990s um, in response to increasing amounts of nutrient, either through uh, higher concentrations flowing in from the rivers or through increased stream flow uh, because of climate change related um, uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen a steady increase with, uh, with the historically maximum size bloom in 2011 and uh, large blooms in 2014 and 2015. I was working with NASA Glenn, Ohio Sea Grant, and colleagues from, uh, from Ohio State, Bowling Green, and others around the, uh, the state to try and monitor what was happening so that we could uh, get resources on the ground to, to fix things. Great, so a couple of things you mentioned that I wanna uh, make sure we unpack a little bit. When you say nutrients, can you unpack, what are, what are nutrients as it relates to water? Yeah, so, uh, so we all wanna have green lawns, right? And so we fertilize our, our lawns, the kinds of nutrients that we add to our lawns, things like uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, allow the plants to have the basic building blocks that they need in order to, to grow their own food and, and give us these nice, uh, healthy lawns. The problem is that those nutrients don't just stay on the lawns, right? So with runoff, uh, rain events occur, and some of those nutrients get into the stormwater system, they make their way to uh, the rivers, and then eventually end up in the, um, um, in, in the lakes and, and waterways in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, uh, there are a number of different sources where that can happen. So uh, we can have runoff from uh, suburban areas, like the, uh, the example I was just talking about. We can have uh, nutrients that are being released into the system from wastewater treatment plants, although those are now very highly regulated. Those point sources are very highly regulated. And where much of the issue that we're having recently is coming from is through agricultural uh, um, uh, runoff. And so we fertilize our food, uh, our, our uh, fields, because we need to have food um, uh, to grow animals and, and to feed ourselves. Uh, but some of that nutrient makes it back into the, uh, into the river, mm -hmm. and that eventually works its way into the, into the lake. And so that's where we get these problems from. And Jay, I'll turn to you with my next question, but it's based on what Joe said. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we call it harmful algal blooms. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my understanding, these are not plants. These are not plants in the traditional sense. Is that right? It, what, it, what, what is harmful algal blooms? <clears throat> these are cyanobacteria, as Joe mentioned before, so that the harmful algal bloom is actually a misnomer. They're actually cyanobacteria that feed off the nutrients that reach Lake Erie. Um, and I just want to take a little step back just to point out that this is a problem that's a lot bigger than Lake Erie. It's that's affecting right. the whole state of Ohio, actually. Last summer, there were blooms along the Ohio River Many of the inland reservoirs in Ohio suffer from harmful algal blooms. Uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's in the northwestern portion of the state is kind of the poster child for this. They have the highest concentrations of microcystin, which is the, the toxin that we talk about. But going beyond Ohio, it's actually a global problem. As you mentioned before, the World Resources Institute had a study a few years ago that identified over 700 downstream areas 
uh, that were both coastal and freshwater that suffered from eutrophication or an overabundance of nutrients reaching uh, downstream locations due to both municipal inputs and agricultural inputs. So it's, we're not alone in Lake Erie or the state of Ohio. It's a global problem that, that we as a society need to figure out ways to address. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and something else that Joe mentioned was uh, sometimes they're toxic and sometimes they're not. And what, what makes it, the harmful algal blooms are algal blooms regardless, but sometimes mm -hmm. they're toxic and sometimes they're not. What, what's, what's the differentiator between uh, what is and what is not toxic? That, that's, that's a great question that, that we don't know the answer to. Oh, and, okay. I'll, and I'll give a, I'll tell you what I know first and I'll defer to Joe after that. Um, we, we think that it has to do with the balance of nutrients that are available in Lake Erie and other water bodies. So when there's more or less nitrogen could be one of the things that favors toxin, ver, toxic versus less toxic algae. Uh, the temperature and other variables within the lake seem to favor toxic versus less toxic algae. And we're trying to do research right now to better understand that. That's a really important question. And as Joe said, to be able to be able to predict when blooms are toxic so that we can treat the water that people are drinking, there's a really important question that we're trying to get to the bottom of now. Sure. Yeah, that, that's a uh, uh, you know, great point to make. And you know, these organisms are among the oldest organisms uh, known on, on, on the planet, right? Their uh, record goes back uh, billions of years. Uh, so some of the ideas about why they produce these toxins, uh, originally folks thought that they were producing the toxins as protection from predation, from being grazed by, by animals. The difficulty with that explanation is that the genes that generate these toxins are 3.8 billion years old or 3.5 billion years old. They're so old that they predate multicellular life, the kinds of things that would feed on these cyanobacteria. So that can't be the, the sole answer. Mm -hmm. um, another difficulty or another uh, potential uh, source of what might be causing this is uh, these organisms are, um, uh, are monera, right? So they don't have internal organelles. And so that means that they have to carry out the biochemistry of their life within their cellular, uh, cellular machinery, within the cell protoplasm itself. And that leads to oxidants that can cause uh, problems from them from a physiological sense. Mm -hmm. And so one idea is that these toxins are generated in order to try and act as antioxidants within their, uh, their, their body machinery. So that's one possibility. Um, another idea uh, relates to these, these nutrient-related issues, and there's, there seems to be evidence associated with that. So uh, uh, scientists, and we've noticed that uh, they uptake uh, nitrogen in uh, large amounts before they start to produce the, the toxin. And the reason for this is for each mole of, of a toxin that they produce, um, it has uh, seven nitrogen um, atoms that are uh, incorporated into that. So there's a lot of nitrogen within this storage space. So one possibility is that they're doing it in order to uh, maintain that internal nitrogen store for when times get bad. Mm -hmm. um, in years, in 2014, we had a, a smaller bloom that was more toxic, mm. right? And so one possibility is that they were scavenging up that nitrogen in order to have it available for later growth. Um, so there, there's a number of different hypotheses that have been generated to think about why that might be, uh, be the cause. And understanding ultimately why they're producing these toxins will help us potentially to know when to be concerned about when we might have a toxic uh, bloom or to figure out ways to, to deal with these organisms. Sure. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, the other question I have is, um, it seems not all bodies of water are created equal. Not all of them are necessarily susceptible or as susceptible. Uh, and, and based on what you said, it seems like the ones that are near uh, lots of agricultural activity, uh, farms, uh, farming, uh, or in you know, uh, places where other kinds of runoff and, and nutrients enter the water. But what are some of the sort of the factors that create blooms, let's say, more so near the Toledo area, less so in the Cleveland area? Why is the Toledo area more ripe for bloom activity than, say, Cleveland is? Well, unfortunately, Western Lake Erie is a, a really ideal place for harmful algal blooms. Um, one of the main reasons is because it's a very shallow portion of the lake, so it warms very quickly. The, the cyanobacteria likes warm water. That's why you have a, a, the perfect window of these is in late summer, early fall when the water's warm. You also have an abundance of nutrients there. So the Mommy Watershed, where I focus a lot of my work, um, has about 70% row crop agriculture, so it's a large source of nutrients, especially the soluble phosphorus, which really fuels the algal bloom. So there's high concentrations of nutrients, 
a shallow water body, warm water, it's the perfect place for, for algae to grow or for mm -hmm. the cyanobacteria to grow. It's a good place for algae to grow too. Sure. Um, towards Cleveland and towards the eastern portion of the lake, you get deeper water, it's cooler, so that's, that's the main reason you have a lot bigger problem in the western portion of Lake Erie than the central or eastern portion of Lake Erie. If I could add to yeah, that please. Uh, as well, the, uh, most of the, uh, the stream flow into Lake Erie also occurs in the Western Basin, mm -hmm. and so the nutrient input yeah. is concentrated there. Um, to add to the complexity of this story, it also depends on the type of, of cyanobacteria that we're looking at. Right, so I've been working uh, with colleagues from uh, Bowling Green uh, State University, uh, George Buller Jam, um, Mike McKay, in um, Sandusky Bay, and there, the bloom is fueled by a different genera, right? So Planktothrix is the dominant uh, critter in, uh, in Sandusky Bay. And that organism also can produce microcystin, which is the toxin that's produced by microcystis, the genera that's found in the Western Basin, right? Those two organisms have very different life strategies, mm -hmm. right? So microcystis is colonial. It likes to live in high light conditions up near the surface. And so it forms those large uh, slicks and algal mats on the surface that paint the water green, right? Planktothrix is not colonial. It's adapted to low light conditions. It can uh, uh, extract uh, nitrogen very efficiently from the water. And so it can grow at uh, lower nitrogen levels than, uh, uh, than uh, microcystis. And so you have these very different uh, ecologies that play into the development of of the, uh, the bloom problem and the toxins associated with them. So when, when uh, this is probably going to be my last question on, on this topic, um, when the water is toxic, what does that mean for, for us? Can we swim in it? Can we, can we still drink it? How, how, you know, how bad is it for us as, as humans? Yeah, that, uh, that's a really good, uh, good question, right? So if you go along the, uh, the coast to our waterways where there are problems like this, you'll see uh, warning signs uh, stating that when toxins are present in the water, um, you need to uh, be careful and not have contact. Mm -hmm. um, and this d varies depending on, on individuals. So the recommendation is for less contact from uh, the elderly, from children, or individuals with compromised immune um, systems. Uh, the contact limit that, uh, that we've been working with is one parts per billion, mm -hmm. right? For this, that's um, set by the World Health Organization. In Sandusky Bay uh, this past summer, the levels were on average about four parts per billion and got as high as about 30 parts per billion um, at times during the, uh, the summer. We were able to actually uh, avert a shutdown of the Toledo, uh, not the Toledo, the Sandusky water system uh, because we gave them warning early enough to, uh, to make sure that they stepped up the cleaning procedures so that the water didn't get contaminated. And so the kinds of efforts that have been put in place by Ohio Sea Grant, by the governor's office, by uh, the, uh, the colleagues from the various universities that have been working with NASA Glenn and, and other uh, uh, resources, ODNR Watercraft, have been out there to try and protect uh, the individuals and make sure that we know what's happening so that we can prevent um, another crisis like the one that happened in Toledo. Just to add to that a little bit, so um, public health, there's another important thing to be aware of beyond just drinking water and, and physical contact through swimming, but it's also the food we eat. Yeah. So we're doing research now at Ohio State looking at the sport fish from Lake Erie, the yellow perch, the walleye to see if they have concentrations of microcystin that we should be worried about. We're also looking at the possibility of irrigating crops, irrigating the food we're growing with water with microcystin in it and see if microcystin will accumulate in the produce that we eat as well. So those are, there's at least three important public health concerns, swimming, drinking water, and then uh, the food we eat as well. Great. Okay, well, we're going to switch over to talk about solutions. And then towards the end of this section, we're going to turn it over to you guys, who some of which are still awake. Um, <laughs> somebody wake him up. There, that guy. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. Um, uh, to talk about solutions, and then we'll take some of your questions. So be thinking of some <coughs> questions to ask. 
Uh, so, Kathy, we'll start with you since you've been so patient uh, while uh, Joe and Jay gave us this, the science behind what we're talking about today. Um, we're talking about solutions. Uh, tell us about the year of water at the city of Cleveland. Not necessarily specific to harmful algal blooms, but generally, what were some of the things that you worked on at the city uh, to you know, preserve our freshwater resources? Okay, so during the um, years leading up to 2019, for Sustainable Cleveland, we have celebration years. Uh, this year is the year of sustainable transportation. Last year was the year of clean water. And for that celebration year, we partnered with the Cleveland Water Alliance along with 200 other individuals from 60 different conservation organizations to work together um, to come up with new programs um, and to work on solutions together. Um, there were several initiatives that we did together. One was we created a bottle pledge where individuals and or organizations would make a pledge to reduce or eliminate their use of plastic bottled water. Um, that was one initiative that we all participated in. There were 52 organizations that signed that pledge. Um, another initiative... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but why is that important? Why is it important to reduce our bottled water use? Well, one reason is because we're very lucky here in Cleveland to have great tap water. So there actually is no reason to create more waste by using plastic disposable water bottles. Also, the, the water that's put into those water bottles isn't regulated as well as Cleveland tap water. So there's a good chance that you're drinking municipal tap water anyway. Another big reason is to save you money. If each of us drank the eight glasses of eight ounces of water every day, uh, for an entire year, and if you drank that water out of plastic water bottles, it would cost you $1,700 for a year. Whereas if you just drank Cleveland tap water, it would cost you 82 cents. So, and another reason is, the, the big reason is the waste. <coughs> I mean, there's no reason to be generating that plastic waste. And that's a whole nother forum to talk okay. about plastic Great. pollution. <laughs> so what else, what kind of in other initiatives were there through the year of clean water? Um, another initiative was with our watershed groups. Um, there's about 12 different watershed groups in this region. And they found that by combining their resources, they could be much more effective. So last year, the Central Lake Erie Basin Watershed collaborative was formed so that all those watershed groups can work together and share their resources. Um, can, and, sorry to interrupt you again. Yes. Can you explain, what is a watershed? I don't think it's common knowledge what a water, I don't know what one is. What is a watershed? A watershed is that area of land that drains into a particular body of water. So there's the Lake Erie watershed, there's the Cuyahoga River watershed, um, there's many watershed groups for some of our smaller waterways. Uh, Euclid Creek, West Creek, Big Creek, Rocky River, Dome Brook, Dugway Brook. Um, and so there's about 12 major watershed groups that formed together. And so they're working together to? To combine resources. Um, little things like um, if there's a, a festival and they want to have a, a table. Instead of having 12 different tables, they combine their resources because they're all, they all have the same message to give and the same resources, so they combine their efforts sure. so that they can all be more effective. Okay. Um, a couple things that our office specifically did last year was we received two grants related to clean water. One was a federal grant through NOAA the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association to develop a social marketing campaign around three plastic marine debris items, which were plastic water bottles, plastic grocery bags, and plastic <coughs> cigar tips. From beach cleanups done by the Alliance for the Great Lakes, we know that those three items 
make up about over 50% of the waste that we find or the trash that we find on our beaches. Um, so this social marketing campaign uh, will be a pilot in the city of Cleveland and then be expanded to other Great Lakes cities. Another grant we received was from the Ohio EPA Environmental Education Fund and that was to provide training in maintenance for maintaining stormwater control measures in uh, municipalities in Northeast Ohio. Uh, these stormwater control measures include things like rain gardens, uh, permeable pavement, bioretention cells, stormwater basins, um, rain barrels and cisterns. These are all measures that can be taken by individuals and by municipalities, which is where our focus is, to help reduce the stormwater runoff that Joe had mentioned. Um, this occurs when rain or snow melt hits a hard surface, of which our cities have many. I mean, those hard surfaces can be driveways, uh, pavement, parking lots, roofs. These are all surfaces where the water isn't allowed to infiltrate into the ground like it naturally should do, but instead runs off and into our storm drains, which are not treated and um, take water right to our lakes. Um, so all of the pollutants, any fertilizer maybe that's been put on your lawn, any other contaminants, run off these hard services into the storm drains and untreated to the lake. Okay, well thank you. Sounds like the city's doing a lot. Maybe you'll come up with other things uh, throughout the conversation to, yes. to bring up. So Jay and Joe, what, what, what else, uh, maybe we'll start with Jay since you're just uh, closer to me. Um, what, what, are you, what are you working on? What are, what are your colleagues working on to address the issue of harmful algal blooms? Yeah, I'd like to talk about the, the source of the problem and, and some of the innovations that have been made in the agricultural front. As Joe said earlier, some, some of the nutrients that come to Lake Erie are coming from municipal sources. Um, the majority of the nutrients that come out of the Maumee River and other watersheds that feed into western Lake Erie are coming from agricultural sources. So agriculture really has a role to play. And there's many innovations and a lot of action taking place there. So uh, NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, just came out with a rec very recent report that highlighted that on uh, about 99% of the acres in the Western Basin, there are conservation practices that are taking place. So farmers are, are um, taking a step here to make some changes in their farming practices to try to limit some of the nutrients that do come into Lake Erie. Um, there's a lot of best management practices in the business. We call those BMPs. Um, some of the most important ones there are subsurface application of nutrients. So for many years in Western Lake Erie, in the Western Lake Erie Basin, farmers have surface applied nutrients. So they've, just as we would on our lawns, if you have a lawn, we sprinkle fertilizer on the lawn. Farmers have put fertilizer on the surface of their fields. And then what happens when there's a big rainstorm just after that, foosh, a lot of that, a lot of those nutrients, the phosphorus and nitrogen goes right into the rivers and eventually gets into Lake Erie. So one of the things we're really pushing and farmers are adopting is subsurface application nutrients. So getting it into the soil, not putting it on the surface, and that will limit the amount of nutrients that come off the field. Uh, buffer strips is another important practice that farmers are adopting. So instead of farming right up next to a uh, creek or a stream, farmers will have a buffer strip of natural vegetation there to intercept some of that surface runoff and hold some of those nutrients in place and keep it from getting into streams. Uh, there's other innovative practices such as two-stage ditches, which are a new way that farmers can drain their fields, which provides some improvement in water quality of, of the water as it moves from the field to the streams. Um, there's many other important practices that farmers are adopting. Another innovation that's happening, I don't know if it's innovation, but it's important to note that NRCS just announced there's going to be a $41 million investment, additional investment in, um, in the basin to help farmers, to support farmers economically adopting these best management plans to help them get them on their field to limit the amount of nutrients that comes off the field. So there's a lot of innovation, a lot of new practices being adopted by farmers. But, but what's important to note is that while that's happening, 
there has to be a whole lot more of it. So in another, in another recent report that just came out that I worked on, it was led by the University of Michigan. Ohio State was a partner in it as well as other regional. Did you say Ohio State and Michigan? Ohio State partnered and Michigan were partnered together okay. on this. We, had a, we sure. had a great collaboration. Heidelberg University, USGS was involved, USDA was involved. So there were a lot of players in this. Um, and what we tried to do was look at if we, want to, if we want to meet the 40% reduction in nutrients, which has been uh, an identified target to get the harmful algal blooms to a safe level, what amount of BMPs, what amount of management practices do, do we need on the land to get to that reduction? And so we um, utilized a multi-model approach, different types of ecological engineering models to answer that question. And what we found out is that we will be able to reach that maintaining the agriculture productivity that we have with an aggressive adoption of best management practices. Mm -hmm. So if we can keep this level, if not only keep, but increase the level of adoption of best management practices by farmers, we should be able to limit the amount of nutrients that come off the Maumee watershed, the Sandusky watershed, and get into Lake Erie. Um, and with that, we should be able to get harmful algal blooms to a safe level for both the ecosystem and for humans. Okay, great. Joe, tell us a little about your work. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I'd be happy to do that. So um, I work more on the, the monitoring end of the, uh, the issue, but it ties into the kinds of, of, of work that Jay is talking about here as well. So we think of these harmful algal blooms as big monolithic structures or, or, or entities that are composed of just one type of, of uh, a plankton. And the reality is that there's actually lots of different types of plankton that are associated with these. And that signal gets mixed up in the light that bounces uh, or uh, reflects off of the surface. <coughs> the techniques and tools that I've developed in my lab allow me to separate out that information so that I can pinpoint the different types of organisms that are present within the, um, within the lake on the basis of their optical properties, on uh, basically effectively the color of the light that they reflect back. And that's really important because some of the signal is associated directly with the toxins, but some of the signal is not. And we also have um, um, other features that will obscure it, like uh, the amount of sediment that's in the water or the, uh, the amount of, of dead organic material, what we call colored dissolved organic matter, or CDOM. And so these techniques let us separate that information out, and that allows us to actually pinpoint where the uh, harmful algal blooms are coming on a day-by-day -day basis, uh, assuming that we have access to satellite images from that. And so that becomes important from a management uh, practice, because now we can go and say, OK, well, it looks like this tributary is the one that's really contributing in this area, so let's improve the BMPs that we have in place on that watershed so that we can minimize these kinds of problems. Um, I'm going to pause in my line of questioning to, to have you guys come up and ask some of yours. So don't be shy. Can, uh, we need you to come up to the microphone right here. And say your name and uh, where you live and ask your question. Hi, my name is Calvin Chesler. Um, I live in Sugar and Falls. And I understand that a lot of the, um, uh, the producer of the problem comes from runoff of fertilizer from farms. And I know that happens a lot around like the Toledo Sandusk area, but would you say it happens more in like Leamington in Canada that runs off into Lake Erie or more on the United States side? So th that's a great question. And, and uh, I've, I've heard that one before and it's really important to understand where the nutrients are coming from into Lake Erie. So when you look at what comes from the Detroit River coming from Canada and also from the other Great Lakes, um, that's about 50% of the phosphorus comes from that way. So about half the phosphorus coming into Lake Erie is coming from Detroit, from Canada. Um, the other half comes from places like the Maumee River, the Sandusky River. So half, so that's, that's where the nutrients are coming from. Now the other important thing is to understand is where's the water coming from? I think it's about 90% of the that's water correct. comes yeah. from Detroit. So a, a, the bulk of the water comes from Detroit, half the nutrients. About 5% or less of the water comes from the Maumee and Sandusky, but yet they're bringing in the same amount of nutrients as Detroit. So you have a lot higher concentration of nutrients coming from Maumee and Sandusky. And so um, 
it's this, this high concentration nutrients coming from the West, coming from the Maumee and Sandusky that really fuel the algal growth. So it's, it's the same mass of nutrients coming from both sources, but it's the higher concentrations that really fuel the growth of the algae. And so it's, and, and it, you also have to think about it from how do we solve this problem? So, right. okay, if we want to reduce the amount of nutrients coming from Detroit, that's going to be a really hard problem because it's a really low concentration. And when you try to reduce nutrients that are already in a low concentration, it's very costly. What's coming down from, um, what's coming from Toledo, from the Maumee River, is a really high concentration, so it's a little easier, a lot easier, to reduce those, that, that level of nutrients coming from that source, and that's actually what drives the harmful algal bloom. So if we want to make a stride in solving the harmful algal blooms, we really need to focus on the Maumee watershed, the Sandusky watershed. And um, one more thing, I know that um, phosphorus and nitrogen are some of the important ingredients in making fertilizer, and I know they're also what mostly feed the algal blooms, but would it be possible to create a fertilizer that can't be used as food for the algal blooms? You know, that's a really good point, and people are actually doing that, right? So uh, Scott's, one of the major distributors of uh, lawn fertilizer, has, uh, has now removed phosphorus from, uh, from their lawn products. And so that's going to help to, to improve this problem because ultimately phosphorus is a, a very important nutrient in terms of, of leading this growth because there are so uh, few ways that it can be produced and get into the system, right? So naturally phosphorus is put into the system by the weathering of, of um, a bedrock. And, um, and so each plant that's growing out there or the, the algae that we're talking about generally need one uh, molecule of, of phosphorus for each 16 molecules of nitrogen that they bring in there. And so if you can, uh, the, the traditional thinking is if you can cut off the phosphorus supply, you can minimize the bloom. Now, uh, more recent research is showing that uh, nitrogen can in fact be an important uh, stimulant in terms of, of this bloom growth. And so it really becomes important to try and manage both nitrogen and phosphorus. So thank you for that question. That's, that's very thank helpful. You. Please. Hello, uh, I'm Ethan Banks. I live in Pepper Pike. And one of the things that I had read about is that in Western Lake Erie, there is a lot of clay. And that clay um, allows a lot of the water that runs off to go straight through it, through cracks and macro pores, without ever being filtered out of the nutrient without any of the nutrients being filtered out and I was wondering if that is a large problem and if it is um, what are any possible solutions for that? That's a great question and one that we talk a lot about when we when we look at this problem so uh, just to take a step back so there's a lot of there are a lot of clay soils in the western Lake Erie Basin and that whole area is, is what we call poorly drained when we talk about agricultural land and so in order to grow corn and soybeans in poorly drained fields, you have to have what's uh, known as subsurface drainage. So that helps m remove water from those poorly drained soils. So you have basically uh, plastic pipes running underneath the soil that can take water, it can drain those fields. The plastic pipes are perforated, so they take up water. What can happen uh, and does happen related to your question for macro pores is that when farmers, especially when farmers surface apply those nutrients, as I mentioned before, they broadcast those pellets of nutrients to the surface. When there's a rain event, there can be a direct connection of the surface flow to these tiles. So through those macro pores, you talked about the water can move through those macro pores with the nutrients right to the tiles, and then it goes right to the streams. So some of the practices that we're suggesting to um, address the macro pores that you mentioned is to bring back some minimal uh, tilling to these fields. So what's, what's traditionally been adopted by a lot of the farmers over the past two or three decades is no-till, no-tillage agriculture, where they plant corn and soybeans without tilling the soil. And this has great benefits for um, soil health and to eliminate erosion of sediments, which is a big problem for all farmers. They like to hold on to their soil. But what we're finding is that when you do that practice for many years in a row, these macro pores that you talked about can, can be developed. So one of the things we're considering is having uh, rotational tillage or maybe having tillage every few years to break up those macro pores and break up that connection from the surface to those tile drains or those subsurface drains. 
So yeah, that is a big problem. That's a great question, and it's one we think of sometimes, and we have thought of some, some ways to address it. Thank you. Yeah, and cover crop maintenance might be mm. an important part of that, yep. that process. Yep. And, and this is a really good point to bring up because um, the reason why uh, many of the farmers in the area have moved to no-till agriculture is because that was identified as a BMP in order to minimize sediment uh, loss and sediment runoff into the waterways and into the lakes. And so we solve one problem, but in the process of doing that, we contribute to another potential problem, which is the nutrient runoff. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the legislature has recently taken some action in order to try and address this. So one of the practices that was being developed was the spreading of fertilizer uh, during the, the wintertime or early spring before the spring thaw. And that exacerbated this problem. It made it worse because the nutrients would then sit on the, the frozen land and then be carried off with the, uh, uh, with the spring floods into the system. So the legislature just moved to ban that practice so that um, uh, farmers will wait until after the spring thaw in order to start to apply fertilizer. And so that associated with the, uh, the practice that Jay was mentioning of, of deep injection, trying to get the nutrients into the soil should help to try and minimize both these. And so we come to some kind of compromise in terms of trying to deal with some amount of, of tillage and cover crops to minimize soil erosion, but also other uh, approaches to try and minimize the nutrient runoff. Mm -hmm. Any other questions to this point? Oh. All right, All now right. we're starting to see a line. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlie, I'm from Moreland Hills. Um, one of the uh, American ideals is having a flourishing green lawn. Should local governments be discouraging that American ideal? I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of jumps ahead to what we were talking about for challenges. Um, yes, we definitely need to change our ideal that a green manicured lawn is the ideal. Um, what we prefer is having rain gardens in your, in your front yard, or a vegetable garden, or a native plant garden, um, trees. Um, those are all stormwater control measures. Uh, a very manicured green lawn, um, it can be as hard a surface as your driveway or as the road. Grass typically, or turf grass typically, have roots that are very short. They're, they don't go very deep, whereas native plants, their roots can be several feet deep, so they're going to be better at helping with that infiltration of the rain and snow melt. So that definitely gets to a point we need to, to change ordinances so that homeowners can put in rain gardens and other kinds of gardens. Um, and it all gets to behavior change and perception change. Thank you. My name is Dylan Siegler. Um, I live in Solon. And earlier you were talking about how uh, these blooms affect our lives. Um, I was wondering how they affect uh, not only the local economy, but like the larger economy of Ohio and beyond. I, I think one thing we have to consider in Ohio is that we're, we're a state we're an area or a region where we have an abundant supply of water. When you, when you compare Ohio to a place like California or Arizona that's water stressed, Ohio has an abundant supply of water. So <coughs> as, as businesses or companies consider moving to places that have water, they might consider moving to Ohio from places that are water stressed. While we have an abundant amount of water that might attract industries or business, we also need to maintain the water quality because it's only, it's only helpful if we have um, high water quality of our water supply. So if we want to think about attracting companies and industries to Ohio from other places that are water stressed, it's really important that we maintain our, our water quality as well. So that's, that's kind of a bigger regional economy way to look upon water quality. Thank you. Thank you. What about, I want to build on, what was your name? Uh, Dylan. Dylan, I want to build on Dylan's question. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what is the impact uh, 
on on you know agriculture is a huge one of probably the, the largest industries mm -hmm. in in, uh, in Ohio I mean, uh, or the tourism industry that that deals with the sort of the um, what are those islands uh, right above us uh, where people go to vacation to Lake Erie see Island. Bass Island yeah. and mm -hmm. and uh, where, the one huh. Kelly's. Kelly's, yeah, Kelly's Island, and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Uh, you know, the tourism industry. What What are some of the effects on them, and and the fishing boat boat charter, that kind of stuff? What are the effects on those industries? I'll I'll go with agriculture first. So I th I think one one of the things we need to understand is that to move forward, we need to find balanced solutions so that we can maintain our agriculture productivity while having good water quality for Lake Erie and the, and the rivers that feed Lake Erie. So the solutions that we try to find, as I mentioned before, are, are solutions that will maintain our agricultural productivity. So farmers can maintain the yields they get for corn and soybeans, but adopt BMPs or aggressively adopt more BMPs to try to improve water quality. It's really important to find those types of solutions because as you said, agriculture is a major industry, major economic engine in the state of Ohio. So we need to be able, be able to maintain that base while we improve our water quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, well, thank you, Dylan. Yes, thank you. We'll take another question and then we'll <laughs> jump back in. Hi, I'm Will Spencer from Moreland Hills. And I'd like to know if there's anything being done physically out on the lake to prevent these blooms, such as physical removal, and if physical removal is able to make a significant impact in the amount of algae out on the lake. Um, I've, I've heard this uh, brought up before and we have thought about it, but when you look at the scale of Lake Erie, it's massive. And as, as Joe said before, these blooms are usually not concentrated in a few areas. They're spread out over really large areas. And so when you look at the, the challenge and the scale involved, it's, it's really prohibitive to the approach of physical removal right now. Um, it might be something to consider in the, fu in the future, but right now it's, it's uh, cost prohibitive just because of the scales involved. So it's, it's not something that we're focused on right now as a solution. In, in addition to that, you'd also have to deal with the fact that you have a, a potentially concentrated toxic mass that you've, you've just collected as well. And so, uh, uh, you know, the strategies that we're really working on is trying to figure out what triggers the production of the, of the toxins so we can hopefully maybe turn it off if that's the case or uh, maybe shift the conditions so that we don't have toxic blooms but rather non-toxic blooms. And ultimately, if we can cut the nutrient um, sources by 40% or so, um, that will get us back to the kinds of conditions that we had in the early 1990s when these weren't as big a problem. Uh, and you know, 40% might sound daunting, uh, but there are other places around the world that have it much harder to deal with, right? So um, one example is uh, a lake in China called Lake Taihu. And so Lake Taihu has uh, massive blooms that occur during the springtime there as well. Um, the difficulty in Taihu is that they haven't put in the kinds of wastewater treatment plants that are now standard here in the United States. And so their estimates are to turn off their blooms, they would need to cut their nutrient content by about 90 to 95 percent. So, um, you know, twice as hard to do as, as what we have to work towards. All right, thank you. Great, thanks thank for your you. question. Joe, uh, I, I want to turn back to you to maybe dig a little deeper into the kind of work you do, if you could sure. explain some of the mechanics because it involves satellites and space and all sorts of cool stuff. So if you could unpack a little bit just in, you know, how all that works and how you get these images you know, from outer space and how you analyze them. A absolutely. Yeah. So we've been working very closely with, uh, um, with the optics group at uh, NASA Glenn uh, Research Center, a world-class research facility. They have an instrument called a hyperspectral <coughs> sensor. Um, it's an instrument that measures the, the quantity of light that's reflecting off of the surface. So the sun shines down on the surface of the, of the water. Some of that energy gets absorbed by the water and scattered. Some of it gets scattered in the atmosphere. Um, that energy is what these uh, algae and cyanobacteria are using to photosynthesize, to generate their own food and so on. Right? And so what we do is we head out onto the water with, uh, uh, with various um, research craft. We collect surface samples so that we can quantify what's in the water, the different types of algae, the types of pigments that are present, because that's what's absorbing the, uh, the solar energy. 
And uh, we use an instrument called a, a spectral radiometer, which is the same kind of technology that's either flying on this aircraft or up in space on a satellite. We can take that information and we then look at how each of the signals from these different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum relate to each other, how they're correlated. And on the basis of that correlation, we can then tease apart the signal in order to figure out the different types of, of pigments that are present. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that uh, there are characteristic patterns of pigment associations. And so some of those pigments are the ones that are found in these toxic uh, algae. We've grown those organisms in the lab. We've measured their, their spectral signatures. We get back spectral signatures that look very similar to the fingerprint that we find for this material when it's out in the water. And so we can say that's the signal that we're looking for to identify what's toxic. We can then separate out that signal from, uh, from the other sources of, of um, light absorption in the water and use that to quantify how large uh, the bloom is or, or what its concentration is at a location. Mm -hmm. uh, when we apply this to satellite remote sensing technologies, we can then generate images on a daily basis with uh, satellites like MODIS. Um, those have uh, a coarser <coughs> spatial resolution, so we get a one kilometer footprint from the device because it's, it, if we're getting lots of data in time, then we have to compensate for that by getting less data in terms of space. Mm. Right? With instruments like um, Landsat, Landsat has higher spatial resolution, so we get a 30 um, uh, meter footprint from Landsat, but it only comes by once every 14 days. And what is Landsat? Landsat is another sensor that's, uh, that's maintained by the USGS in order to, uh, to look at the, uh, the characteristics of uh, the land surface, but it also works over water. One of the real nice things about Landsat is that it's a series of satellites that have been up for decades. And so it provides continuity so that we can look at how things have changed over very long periods of time. Sure. And there's, there's new sensors that are um, in the process of being developed now to, to go up that will give us even better capabilities. Right? So Landsat is a multispectral sensor. It has um, <coughs> a number of bands in the visible. It has four bands in the visible uh, that we work with. MODIS. Uh, which is um, a series of sensors, the ones that go over daily, those have 10 bands in the visible. Uh, the instruments that uh, NASA is working on putting up in the future, PACE, HISPIRI, and uh, GEOCAPE, will have many more bands. They're going to be hyperspectral instruments. They'll have 100 bands or, or so in that, that range. We're still trying to work out some of the details of, of what the um, band uh, 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 resolution is going to be. Mm -hmm. But having a sensor like that up in space will give us the ability to, uh, to pull out the maximum amount of information that we can from, uh, from the surface so that we can better identify the different types of stuff that's out there in the water. Great. So, so obviously you're looking at it from on high. Jay, what about some of the research that, that you're doing? Obviously you, you spoke earlier before we took questions about um, you know, the various ways farmers are addressing the issue with, mm -hmm. with different trenching and other things. Um, but what, what's some of the research that you specifically are, are doing? So a lot of the research that I focus on right now is developing simulation models. Um, and those are actually computer models that help us better understand what's happening across a, a, a big landscape such as the Maumee watershed. And so a simulation model takes in knowledge that, we, knowledge that we know what happens on a fine scale and can extrapolate that over a large scale. So on a small scale, if we could imagine that this table was um, a bit of farmland and we knew how much water, how much rainfall was falling on that, based on the soil properties, the tilt of the landscape, the slope, we could estimate how much of that water was going to run off that table and into a river adjacent to it, or how much that water is going to infiltrate. We can also uh, look at the, the amount of phosphorus fertilizer that's on, that, that's on that table or that field, and by knowing how much water runs off um, or how much water infiltrates, we can also predict which way those nutrients will go. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and then we can also add in some of the best management practices I mentioned before. So if some of that phosphorus fertilizer was applied on the surface, more of that's going to run off during a rainstorm. If some of it's applied in the soil, as we talked about before, subsurface application, less of that phosphorus is going to run off, more of it's going to stay in the field so the plants can use it. So by extrapolating that or building that across a huge uh, basin, such as the Maumee Basin, which is four million acres in size, we can understand better how many 
um, management practices we need across that entire basin to get the type of reductions we need. We can also look at the impacts of if 30% of the farmers adopt subsurface application or 40% of the farmers adopt buffer strips, what's the overall reduction of nutrients from the Maumee watershed or the Sandusky watershed? So we can start to take this knowledge that we have on the small scale and look at the impacts of these best management plans across a larger scale. And that's, that's some of the work we try to do. We, we're also looking at not only the effects of different types of management plans over time, but we can also look at the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of the work we've done looking across many different climate models shows that in Northwest Ohio, we're going to see more intense rainstorms and greater amounts of rainfall in the spring. And when we first think about that, we think, well, that's gonna lead to more runoff in the spring and probably more algal blooms. And so by we can test that hypothesis with these models. So we can take the models I just talked about and say, okay, wonder if there is more rainfall in the spring, what's gonna happen? And what we're finding is that if we don't change our management practices, we are indeed going to have uh, more intense harmful algal blooms in the future that relate to that heavier rainfall that I mentioned before. So that's some of the work we're doing at Ohio State right now. And, and do you work in concert with, uh, with farmers? I mean, do you work directly with them? Yeah. So you're not just in a lab by yourself, you're, you're actually working with them on, on actually, these Actually, sometimes, sometimes I wish I could be more in the lab by myself, <laughs> but, it, but it is important to work with uh, the stakeholders, the farmers, and the commodity groups to understand the practices that are happening on the landscape and to know what level of adoption exists now so that we know what's happening now so that we know what kind of target we should set for the future. And it's important to know from farmers what types of management practices they can adopt. So if we find out that management practice X is the most beneficial for water quality but farmers can't adopt it because economic, economically it doesn't make sense to them or timing wise they don't have time to manage this new practice that's not helpful. So we need to make sure that the practices we identify are something that's feasible for the agricultural community to adopt. So it's really important to stay in touch with the farmers. And we have a lot of on-farm research that's happening right now. So some of the most important research that, that's happening is being done by USDA ARS, Agricultural Research Service, and they do what's called uh, edge of field monitoring. So they'll have a monitoring station set up on two neighboring fields. One of the fields will be conventionally managed the field next door will have a best management practice such as subsurface application and then they have they monitor how much water comes off those fields how much how many nutrients come off those fields and then they can determine what's the effect of this best management plan so that we can simulate it in our models and that we can also tell and sh demonstrate to farmers that if you adopt this it's going to have this positive effect mm -hmm. and, and when we talk to farmers they say that's going to be the most important thing that um, leads to my adoption of these practices is just to see how effective they are. So, sure. so it's really important to manage to do on-farm research and to be in touch with stakeholders and farmers. Sure. Kathy, I want to come back to you with, you know, other solutions the city is exploring with respect to water, but just in general, just in terms of sustainability and, and keeping our environment, you know, in good shape. Well, we were very happy to recently announce the completion of the Cleveland Tree Plan. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, an initiative that spans across our year of clean water and also <coughs> next year's year of green spaces. Um, that's also very important because in a couple weeks it'll be Arbor Day here in Cleveland, April 29th. So there'll be a lot of tree planting and trees are very important for stormwater management, but also to increase property values, to reduce air pollution. Um, trees offer many, many benefits. And unfortunately, the, the tree canopy cover in Cleveland is at 19%, which is very low. And if we don't do something soon to change what we're doing in the city of Cleveland, that number is going to decrease even more. So now we have a tree plan that was developed with many of our partners and um, also completed by Davey Resource Group um, that has nine different actions for the city and for the community to take to make sure that we have 
a better tree canopy cover. So that includes not only planting trees, but also taking care of the trees that we already have. Great, great. Um, so, so Jay, we've talked about your research. Joe, we've talked about your research. Kathy, we've talked a little bit about what the city is doing. What, what kind of initiatives are you aware of that others are, are doing? I mean, your colleagues, I'm sure you go to conferences, you talk to each other, you read each other's papers, uh, research papers. So what other efforts are underway to resolve harmful algal blooms around the country, world, whatever, uh, that you're aware of? Just let's talk about some of those. Sure, well, uh, at, at Kent State, one of the major focuses of the university is also water. Um, and so uh, Ann Jefferson has done some great work in terms of um, uh, looking at the design of, of rain gardens and green infrastructure. Uh, Kelly Turner, a colleague from Geography Department, is looking at, um, at how policy um, implementation can have an impact on harmful algal blooms and, and, um, and other issues related to uh, homeowner um, uh, development and, and HOAs. Um, Xiaojun Mao, uh, my colleague from uh, the Biology Department, is looking at ways to um, to kill the, the actual algae, looking at, um, or the uh, cyanobacteria, looking at other types of bacteria that are effective at um, not only killing the algae, but also breaking down the toxins. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different types of research that's going on um, at that university. Um, there's, there's colleagues around the state that are looking at the uh, different aspects of monitoring, uh, whether it's the folks at the University of Toledo that are doing a lot of the monitoring work for uh, the Western Basin, um, or uh, folks at uh, Bowling Green that I've been working with for a number of years now as well. Great. Jay, what other efforts are you aware of? I, I think some of the most important efforts involve policy. So mm -hmm. um, one of the important programs that I've heard of, and this is something that the Nature Conservancy has been involved with on Saginaw Bay, is a pay for practice where, where farmers are actually paid or um, subsidized to, to implement different management plans based on the impact of those plans. So they can look at the individual fields and look at the risk for phosphorus runoff from those fields and then based on the risk and based on the management practices the farmer is willing to adopt, they will get a cost share to adopt that. So it's, it's targeting the, the management plans to the areas that need it the most and it's helping the farmers that want to adopt it. So it's, so it's effective two ways, not only helping farmers put in these plans, but targeting it to the areas that need it the most. In Ohio, there's a couple of really um, progressive um, policies that have come, come into play recently. One of those is fertilizer certification, and this was brought about by some of the legislation that Joe mentioned um, that happened in the state of Ohio a year ago or so, where now all farmers in the Western Basin watershed, in the Lake Erie watershed that Kathy mentioned, have to um, obtain a fertilizer certification, and I believe that has to be completed in the next two years, and many farmers have already done this, but it really, it really strengthens the importance of farmers soil testing their fields to find out how much phosphorus is already in their fields so that when they apply phosphorus, they don't over-apply it, which leads to runoff. Another really important policy initiative that's, that's coming and it's starting right now are public-private partnerships. And one of those that's important in the agriculture community is the 4R plan right now. So it's 4R, and it's not really important what that means, but what's important is that there are nutrient applicators. And lots of times, farmers aren't the ones that actually apply the fertilizer to their fields. It's nutrient applicators that do that. And so these nutrient applicators are voluntarily being certified uh, by this public-private enterprise to um, apply nutrients in the correct way. So they have, to go under, they have to undergo training to do this and have the certification. And if, if nutrient applicators do this, and I think right now there's 25 firms that have, been, that have gained this certification, mostly in the, the Lake Erie watershed, it's gonna go a long way to getting these, these new practices adopted. So having these public-private partnerships is, is really important. And I, I think we are, we are making a lot of strides in the science, learning new things about management practices on agricultural fields, what's happening in the lake. We're doing some research at Ohio State about drinking water treatment. Those are really important, but I think to solve this problem, it's going to be linkages, uh, new policies that help get these um, new management plans adopted are, are, is really gonna be important as we look to the future. Right. Uh, I wanna come back to you guys before we switch to the next section. The next section is gonna be, what are some of the barriers to uh, the solutions that we talked about? Do you guys have any other questions for them as to what other solutions or anything like that? Or a question from the Science Center? 
please. Hi, I'm, I'm Terry Harmon. I teach at University School. Thanks. And um, I'm, I'm interested in the history of that Western Basin's agricultural contribution to Lake Erie. Um, the, old, the old soil methods of crop rotation uh, are, have been put on the back burner uh, because of the emphasis on corn growing and soybean growing in these markets, especially gasohol production. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some rumors that farmers that were uh, approached about leaving buffer zones around creeks that drain parts of their fields, I mean farmers that had in excess of hundreds of acres, um, when asked to leave uh, 40 to 60 feet, I may be wrong on that, as a buffer zone of natural vegetation to absorb that, some of that runoff you're talking about. Uh, cynical responses were, well, listen, uh, buddy, on this uh, property I have, we have about 11 acres uh, that would be in that buffer zone. That's a lot of money with the corn market. Uh, I can't do that. So uh, my, my question is that with the emphasis in modern agriculture is not only genetic engineering corn and other plants to absorb nutrients and grow fast to get more crops, more volume, uh, how can we absolutely implement some of the things that you very clearly re explained here that contribute to this problem? It seems only that the thrust of agriculture is going to accelerate these problems because of the need to constantly inject soil uh, with nutrients for these genetically uh, altered plants. That's my question. Okay, thank you for that question. So surely there has been a temptation for farmers to expand their acres and maybe take back some of the buffer strips in, uh, in recent years due to the commodity prices that you mentioned before. And, and I have heard that, that anecdote just like you have. But the, um, one of the recent reports I mentioned that just came out from NRCS shows that in the past, I believe five or six years, the amount of uh, cropping acres has, has stayed the same actually. So there, there surely has been change within individual farms, but when you look at the total acreage devoted to corn, soybeans, wheat, other things within the Western Basin, it's roughly stayed the same. So uh, while, while there are anecdotes like that, I think the, the coverage has, has pretty much stayed the same. That's what this report shows. Um, there have definitely been changes in the cropping rotations that you mentioned before. So in the past, there was a more tendency to have wheat in the rotation. It was corn, soybean, wheat, um, winter wheat. That's gone by the wayside lately. Winter wheat, the, the economics aren't there right now. Some of the research that we have that's been completed recently shows that winter wheat can have positive effects on water quality. So if we could get that back into the rotation, if we could get cover crops back in the rotation that Joe mentioned before, we can try to build up that soil and build up the organic matter in the soil. Um, farmers are adopting these practices. So despite the you know, increases in commodity prices and, and you know, urge to expand their, their uh, acreages, they are adopting cover crops they are adopting buffer strips and things like that. So I think we just need to w continue to work with farmers and farmers are interested. They know, that, they know that they're part of the problem here and they know they have to adopt these practices. The reports that have come out show that they are adopting them. The challenge now moving forward is we need to really increase that level of adoption. The public-private partnerships I mentioned before are the way to do that. The new infusion of resources from NRCS are a way to do that, but we're going to need to do even more than that to get to the levels of adoption we need to solve this problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're really seeing an, um, an almost unprecedented amount of collaboration between the different academic institutions in the state, between the research institutions and funding institutions like Ohio Sea Grant and the Ohio Department of Education and, and government. And it, it, we really need to have all three of those groups working together in order to solve these problems. Uh, and we need to have outreach to the general public so that they understand um, what the costs and benefits are of each of these different types of approaches in order to try and improve the, uh, the environment for all of us. Thanks for your question. So we're going to switch over to barriers uh, to solutions. Uh, we'll start with a question uh, from the Great Lakes Science Center. How will increasingly global population and global climate change together impact this problem and the possible solutions to it? Yeah, well, I, I agree with uh, what, what Jay said earlier about um, um, the potential for this to become much worse. 
with respect to, uh, to climate change, right? So um, if we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, we make a more energetic atmosphere. And an energetic atmosphere is one that's more variable. And that variability is going to lead uh, to more extreme events um, that will result in, in flooding and, um, and runoff into the lake. And so one way to think about this, in, you know, just from, from first principles, is if we do nothing right now to decrease the amount of nutrients that are going into the lake, it's most likely going to increase just because of the increased stream flow. Now, of course, there are other factors that control the size of the bloom and, and how it's distributed rather than just stream flow, right? So one of the big differences between 2014 and 2015 were the wind patterns. Right, so in 2014, the winds blew the, the bloom onto the coast, and so that's why we ended up with, uh, uh, with intakes being overwhelmed by, by microcystis. Right? In 2015, the bloom stayed offshore, right? and so we didn't have uh, a situation where there was lots of, of toxic water near the coast. That's consistent with the results that we're seeing out of, uh, out of our remote sensing work. So we can see those kinds of differences. The, uh, the data that we're getting shows that there's a correlation between the, uh, the relative portion of these toxic organisms and the amount of toxin that's in the water. And so that's good news because it provides us with additional tools to try and estimate how these, these things are, are going to shape up in the, in the years to come. I think when you look at population increase, there, there's a couple challenges there. So one of those is related to agriculture. So there have been um, the need for agriculture to continue to produce food, but not, not only maintain the level of production we have now, but increase that. That's going to really accelerate the need for solutions that we can maintain or increase our yields while limiting the amount of nutrients that come off this field. So that, that's a challenge there. Um, when we look, maybe not so much at Ohio, the population increase in Ohio is probably not going to be too huge in the coming years, but when we look at areas like China, Lake Taihu, like Joe said, there the problem is much more related to municipal runoff than agricultural runoff. So in places like that around the world where what's fueling the harmful algal blooms is municipal runoff, when we see increases of population, we're going to see more of the impervious surfaces that Kathy mentioned, and we're going to have a, p a potential for more nutrients coming into those harmful algal blooms and fueling them. The other thing that we need to be aware of, um, in addition to stream flow, Joe mentioned there's other variables that impact the harmful algal blooms. As temperature increases, the harmful algal blooms like it hot. And so as temperature increases, the window that those harmful algal blooms can grow and exist in Lake Erie is going to expand as well. So you not only have the potential for more nutrients coming into Lake Erie, but you have a bigger window of growing time for these um, algal blooms in Lake Erie and Lake Taihu and other places as, as the temperature increases. So the, the forecast right now for climate change and harmful algal blooms is not a good one. Not a good one for humans. It's a good one for harmful algal blooms. But it really emphasizes the need for us to change our behavior and adopt different management plans, both in agricultural areas and municipal areas, to try to address this threat. Sure. And continuing along the line of, of, of barriers to solutions or challenges, Kathy, in the year of water, or even now the year of, of uh, transportation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wh what have you found to be some of the challenges to implementing some of the initiatives and programs that uh, the city has established? Well, I mentioned it earlier when addressing that question, and it's, it's a challenge that our office faces with any sustainability measures that, that we want the, the public to take, and, and it gets down to behavior change. I mean, we're all creatures of habit, and it's really hard to, to change those habits, and sometimes we don't always think about the impact that our actions can take. So changing behaviors, and that gets to one thing is communication. And all of us get our information in different ways, which means that we have to be very creative in the way that we get our message out, whether it's a panel discussion or a newspaper article or a radio show. Um, and we have to, to communicate in all those different ways so that we can get the message out and many of us need to hear that message over and over again before it sinks in and before we recognize that we do have to change our behavior and it, it's also as i mentioned in perceptions like changing how we perceive what a beautiful 
front yard is. It's not a manicured lawn, but maybe it's a rain garden with native plants. Sure. And does that extend to our expectations of maybe what's grown in agriculture? What, you know, should they be growing soybeans and corn or should they be growing other things? Does it extend that, that way as well? It, it can extend that way. The, the, the regional, the, the, the crops that are grown in the Maumee right now are, are more commodities, so it's soybeans and corn, and so there's the, the direct impact on that market from regional consumers is not that great. It's, it's more of a global market. So it would have to be a, a much bigger change than, than a regional change for that. Uh, we are exploring the possibility of growing more uh, local vegetables for farmers markets and things like that in the basin to see how that would impact water quality. And we are seeing an increase in the, in the desire to have those types of, that type of produce available for regional markets. Hmm, okay. Um, what, what other challenges are there? Uh, political challenges or bureaucratic challenges to funding challenges to seeing these solutions through? or maybe at the pace that you would like to see them? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's a number of different strategies that we can use to try and address this, right? So, um, you know, some uh, political perspectives are uh, to put in regulations in order to, to address these kinds of problems. Other folks want to, um, to see us use, um, you know, the free market in order to make these decisions. And so, you know, we're gonna have to come to some compromise between those, those two different perspectives. Um, and I think that education and outreach and information will help in order to do that. Because mm -hmm. um, if you give the people the opportunity to understand what the, uh, the challenges are and what the costs are, then they can make their decisions in terms of, of how they want to pursue or how they want their leaders to pursue solutions to these kinds of problems. I think one thing to keep in mind is how big this problem is and how much time we're going to need to address it. So to, to give a good example of that, the, the governors of Michigan and Ohio and the premier from Ontario came together and they agreed on this 40% reduction and they made a goal to, re, to reach that by 2025, which is now nine years from now. So it's going to take quite a few years to get there. While we're looking at reducing the nutrients and, and, and addressing the root cause of this problem, it's important to look at what's happening on the lake. So while we're reducing the nutrients, we need to make sure that we can maintain drinking water supplies. So we need to do research to find out how can we best treat microcystin, reduce the toxic concentrations that do come into drinking water supplies. How can we track where the blooms are so that we can yeah. warn drinking water treatment plants that there might be a high concentration of microcystin coming into that plant? Are there ways to reduce blooms that are in the lake? So while we're taking this nine, to nine years to reduce the source of nutrients, we need to be very vigilant to protect our public health, water supplies, the health of Lake Erie, the fish in Lake Erie. So we need to keep in mind this is a, a, a big problem. It's going to take a while to address it to get to that 40% reduction we need. And while we're doing that, we have to be vigilant about what's happening on the lake. What about funding? Do you feel like the problem is funded commensurate to its scope? Or I'm sure as researchers you'd love infinite more funding to do so much more cool stuff, but do you feel it's, it's appropriate or do you think there's more opportunity for more funding to be available to, to really speed up progress with what we're doing? I, I think that there's a, there's a great level of funding right now, and especially with uh, the additional of uh, $40 million coming from NRCS, which just announced about a week ago. That, that's a huge <coughs> shot in the arm for what really needs to happen to reduce the nutrients coming in from agricultural sources. There's also plans to improve municipal areas with regards to reducing stormwater runoff and things like that. But the, the report that, that I participated in that was re released by the University of Michigan uh, a couple weeks ago shows that we're going to need even more investment and even more adoption of practices. So while we do see increases in funding happening, I, I do think we're going to need some additional funding to make this happen, to help farmers adopt these practices and keep the research going so that we know what practices are effective and we can maintain our drinking water supplies. Uh, uh, Joe, yeah. you, you oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Ask my well, uh, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, it's been good to see that additional resources being put into this problem, but it's a big problem that affects many of us. And so uh, there are plans to, uh, to increase funding and we do need uh, more resources. Um, from, from a national standpoint or an international standpoint, uh, you know, it's useful to think about those NASA systems that I talked about. So uh, those three different satellites each have slightly different designs in order to collect information either on large areas uh, with very rapid uh, repeats 
or to collect uh, very high resolution data um, in a, in a uh, more gradual uh, time period, every uh, two weeks or so, right? So we're planning on putting up three satellites in the next you know, decade to decade and a half. The Europeans are planning on putting up 16, hmm. right? So it gives you an idea about the kinds of, of resources that need to be put into this, uh, this, this problem. Uh, the more satellites that we can put up in orbit, the better uh, information that we're going to get back in real time. Now, you know, whether those 16 go up or not, we'll, we'll have to see. But so far, um, you know, the Copernicus network, which is the, the European Space Agency's network that they're building, is moving forward um, according to plan. So uh, they have Sentinel-1 up, they put up Sentinel-2, they're putting up a second Sentinel-2, and the plan is to have four of those satellites in orbit. Uh, Sentinel-2 is, is complementary to our uh, Landsat series of satellites, and they'll be putting up Sentinel-3. In fact, Sentinel-3A, the first of these satellites, just went up in February, and that's going to be comparable to, uh, to um, uh, MODIS. In fact, you could argue that it's a superior sensor to MODIS because it has higher uh, bands in, in better placement than that instrument. MODIS mm -hmm. itself has been up for quite some time and needs to be uh, replaced. And so the PACE satellite is the one that's going to be uh, heading up in order to replace that. So, so uh, sorry, go ahead. So, so there is a need for you know, continued um, resource development and uh, particularly to put in uh, infrastructure like these uh, remote sensing uh, capabilities. Uh, the work that's being done at NASA Glenn right now is to develop um, uh, miniaturized uh, hyperspectral sensors that can be put out on drones or put out on aircraft so that we can collect measurements at times when, when we can't take satellite observations, right? So one of the, the difficulties with, with these instruments, one of the major sources of error is clouds, right? So when you have clouds, if there are clouds between the satellite sensor and the lake surface, you're not going to get any measurements. And so uh, an advantage of using things like the, uh, the NASA Glenn HSI is that you can fly under the clouds in order to collect data during those time periods. And that's not, that's not a satellite, right? It's that's not a satellite. This is like an instrument that or? flies on, currently it's flying on an aircraft. Oh, okay. uh, they've flown in on several different air, aircrafts. They're uh, S3 Viking. And uh, last year they were flying in on a Twin Otter aircraft. Uh, they're in the process of building a new version uh, a miniaturized version through, uh, through their group called Rocket University uh, that will fly on a drone. And so, um, you know, with the advantage of getting that out, we can start looking at smaller lakes and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this summer, we're going to be working with Ohio EPA in order to collect measurements from smaller lakes in the area that also have these kinds of problems. Um, but they're small enough that you can't visualize them effectively using satellite technologies, mm -hmm. uh, at least not at the scale that we currently have access to. And the reason they're currently flown on planes and not on drones is because the equipment just too big? Is well, that why? Uh, or? Par part of it is because of, of the size of the instrumentation and needing to miniaturize stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is that we're still developing the technologies and also there are, there are policy issues, right? So the FAA has <coughs> um, uh, regulations that are being put in place um, so to make sure that drones are used in, in safe and, and, and effective ways. And so we're, we're working through that, navigate, uh, that landscape, trying to navigate the solutions to those problems. So you mentioned the satellites uh, we plan on putting, the U.S. plans on putting up, and Europe keeps putting up, or plans on putting up 3 to 16, I think you mentioned. Um, is it not a cooperative environment? I mean, aren't we all sort of interested in the same thing? Unlike, you know, in politics or economics where we're sort of at odds with each other, isn't this a case where, you know, who cares who's putting up what? Aren't you working together? Or is it, is, or is it a little, com you know, competitive where they want to find the solution first or well, better or whatever? Well, well, certainly we're working towards uh, solutions and collaborations, but uh, part of the, the, the issue is that, uh, you know, the world is a big place. And so um, in order for these satellites to be effective, they need to be placed in different uh, locations and different orbits. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a compromise in terms of finding an orbit that's going to, um, to maximize the utility of the, of the sensor to, to the larger community. So uh, to give you an idea about like a GeoCape, for example, GeoCape, um, the plan is to put it in an orbit over the, the Galapagos. It would be in a geostationary orbit. So they would always image the Western Hemisphere right, the North American uh, region. 
right? Uh, there's a similar satellite that was put up by the Koreans that's set to measure over the Korean Peninsula. So that's, that's the kind of, of um, resource where you need to have different satellites that are put up by different areas because we have different, different uh, geographic interests. Okay. Guys, I want to turn it back over to you uh, to ask your questions about challenges to solutions. So most of the solutions are focused on the reducing the input of phosphorus into the lake. So my question was, is how long can phosphorus uh, stay in the lake? Um, so last year we had record, amount, record amounts of rainfall, which swept a massive amount of phosphorus in, uh, into Lake Erie. Uh, could we still feel aftershocks of that this year? And um, if the lake does have a way to get rid of it, what is that? That's a great question. Um, you know, and, and it really does pose or, or, or bring up the ideas about the complexity of this, this situation, right? So the way the, that uh, the phosphorus is, is removed is through, um, uh, through incorporation into organic matter and then that uh, sediments to the bottom of the lake or uh, runoff and, and exit through, um, uh, through Niagara Falls, right? So one of the things that's, that's a challenge is that as you change the, the chemistry of the lake itself and um, either increase or decrease the amount of oxygen in the, the lake, you can remobilize nutrients that have gotten to the bottom and bring them back into play, right? So that associated with wind mixing or so on, um, you know, points out that there is internal recycling within the system. And we're still in the process of trying to sort out the rate at which that internal uh, cycling occurs and how much of the increase in blooms that we've seen is driven by internal uh, nutrient cycling as opposed to just additional uh, input of nutrients. Thank you. Just a couple more things to add to that. Um, I, th I think it's one, one of the things that's really hopeful here is that it's clear that when there's a year where we have less rainfall and less nutrients coming into the lake, we have much smaller algal blooms. So like Joe said, there's a lot of phosphorus that's stored in the sediments of the lake. That appears to not be what's driving the algal blooms. And the evidence of that is when we have a big rainfall year, we get a big algal bloom. So it's the, it's the nutrients that are in that are suspended in the lake. When we have a low rainfall year, we get a small algal bloom. So it's, it appears to be the nutrients that are coming in annually that are in the surface of the lake, not in the sediments. The other thing, just to play on what Joe mentioned, is the, is the role of oxygen concentration and the resuspension of those sediments. One problem we haven't discussed here today, in addition to harmful algal blooms, there's a big hypoxic area in Lake Erie that yeah. forms every year. A hypoxic area is an area with low to no oxygen. This has impacts on fish, which need oxygen to breathe. As that, as that area of low oxygen expands, you can have more of an area where you have resuspension of phosphorus. And when you have low oxygen in the water, you have resuspension of phosphorus in the sediments. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that as we bring more nutrients in the lake, have bigger harmful algal blooms, this area of hypoxia will increase and you can have a re more of a resuspension of phosphorus from those sediments. So those are some of the things that, that drive the phosphorus dynamics in the lake. It's complex, like Joe said, and we're trying to better understand it all the time. But that gets that echo question that you, you or the part of your question where you're asking about that. So if you have a large bloom, you create more organic matter, right? That organic matter then gets into the, the sediments, uh, it decomposes at the bottom, and now that uses up the oxygen, and so you can potentially prime the pump with additional nutrients for the, uh, the next round. Thank you. We have a long line of questions. Go right ahead. Right. Uh, I am Graydon Snyder from Minner, and um, I, I was just wondering, because you guys talked about the regulations, well, the systems of regulating the uh, nutrients input into the streams by farmers. Um, is there a way to kind of regulate the nutrients that are going from the rivers into the actual lake? or? That, that's a difficult challenge there because there's the, the, the amount of water that flows from the river into the lake is massive. And so it's hard to 
grab all that water and somehow extract all the phosphorus. There are some good examples of what you're suggesting on a smaller scale. So at, at, on the campus of Ohio State University, we have a constructed wetland facility where we do take some of the water from the Olentangy River that flows through Columbus, have it move through these wetlands and then exit the wetlands and go back into the river. And by doing that, we're able to remove some of the phosphorus, nitrogen, and other pollutants in that water. So one of the suggestions that's been, that's been posed on a smaller scale to re as you suggest, to take some of that phosphorus out of the rivers to uh, restore some of these riverine wetlands along the Maumee River and along the Sandusky River to do just as, you're, just as you're suggesting, to remove some of those phosphorus, some of those nutrients, the phosphorus and nitrogen, before it gets into Lake Erie. Is, is that the solution that's going to solve the problem? I don't think so, but it can help. It can remove some of the nutrients before it gets there. So I, I, don't, I don't think we can just grab and capture all the water coming out of the Maumee or Sandusky but we can <coughs> surely grab some of it and direct it through these constructed wetlands and remove some of the nutrients that way. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, this might be a little far-fetched, but would it be at all possible to kind of like fight fire with fire and introduce kind of an algae that's harmless that will eat the phosphorus before the um, toxic algae will? Well, um, you know, invasive species are, 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 are something that you have to think really carefully about, right? So um, Lake Erie and many of the other Great Lakes face um, lots of invasive species that are introduced each year. Uh, for example, the zebra mussel uh, that came in completely changed much of the ecology of the lake. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we're trying to understand is what conditions are driving the production of the, uh, of the toxins so that we can figure out either how to prevent those conditions from, from occurring by decreasing the amount of nutrients that are coming in, for example, or uh, maybe shift the conditions so that they're favorable to existing uh, algae that are in there that are non-toxic. Um, so that, that might be a, a strategy that, that folks might be able to apply in, in some cases. Your, your idea is being researched by um some folks in Ohio right now, there's organisms called cyanophages, which will prey on the cyanobacteria. The scale that this happens on right now is pretty small. It's, it's not going to resolve the problem, but we are doing research on it to see, okay, can we tweak these organisms or can we change the environment somehow so that it can have a bigger role, uh, that these cyanophages can have a bigger role and reduce the toxic algae. So that it is a possibility and we're looking into that. Thank you. What, one of the cautions along there is that um, um, microcystin is a large molecule. It can't get out of the cells under normal conditions, but when the cells uh, die, they often break or lice, and that then releases the microcystin into the dissolved phase into the water. And so you may solve one problem by decreasing the, uh, the growth of the, of the toxic um, organisms, but you then release that toxin into the environment, and now you have to deal with that as well. So in some ways, there, there's no free lunch, right? Yeah. You have to figure out how to solve the, the problem in a number of different ways. Uh, I'm Dylan Lorianti. I'm from Segmore Hills. I was wondering, like, what does the microcystin do when it's in humans, and also what things are being done to get rid of it out of our water supply? M microcystin's a potent liver toxin, so it attacks the liver. Um, which is an organ that we need to process blood and things like that. So that's, that's how it hurts humans and all mammals. It's actually caused the death of some dogs as well um, in the past. So that, that's what it does in humans. What are we doing with drinking water? The, the, the um, main treatment technique right now to reduce microcystins is activated carbon. So we put in activated carbon in the drinking water treatment plants and that can strip out the microcystin and create safe drinking water so it can lower the concentrations of microcystin. Uh, there is ongoing research right now at Ohio State, other institutions looking at different ways to remove the microcystins from the water that might be more economical or, or take place faster or be easier to do. Um, so right now we're using charcoal to do it or carbon. Uh, we're looking at other ways, UV, ultraviolet methods and things like that. So that's, that's kind of where that stands. Yeah, to give you an idea, during the, the 2014 bloom, 
um, the filters that they were using in order to, uh, to keep the, uh, the organisms out of the, the system are normally rated to last about 100 days. They were having to change those filters on a daily basis. So it gives you an idea about the scale of the problem. Earlier we had the, com to build on your question, earlier we had the comment about economic impacts. And so one of the big economic impacts on the region is drinking water treatment plants. So changing yeah. these filters, which are very expensive, adding charcoal to remove the toxins is a, is a really big economic cost. So if we can, one, reduce the toxins in the lake, we can save uh, resources that way. Or if we can find better ways to treat the water, we can, we can save resources that way too. Thanks, Don. Hello, um, my name is Anish Ganesh from Twinsburg, and my question is that it seems as though currently technology is being used for identification and gathering data, but can technology be used and is it being used to tackle the issue on base? So, uh, uh, so how are we using technology to directly uh, address this problem and, yes. and, and treat it? Yeah, so there, there's a number of different ways that we can talk about. So uh, one of them are the, the best management practices that Jay talked about in terms of deploying instruments that will inject the nutrients into the soil um, so that you don't end up having the, the runoff problem. Um, from, from the standpoint of dealing with these, uh, these organisms, um, there's a number of different technologies for, for trying to, uh, to remove the toxins from the, from the water to produce safe drinking water and so on. Thank you. I, th I think another important technology that's happening on farm fields is, is precision agriculture. Yeah. So we, we can test the soil to find out how much phosphorus is there. We can look at crop yields over years to find out, okay, this, this, area, the cr this area of the field needs more fertilizer than this area. So we can do variable rate fertilizer application. So within the cab of a tractor, you can have a GIS um, instrument that guides a tractor and directs how much phosphorus to put here and how much phosphorus to put here. Overall, that'll give us a more optimized uh, fertilizer implementation or fertilizer application, and that'll lead to less runoff. So there's a lot of techno technological advances that are happening with agriculture machinery, looking at being able to inject fertilizer and being able to apply it where it's needed and exactly how much is needed and actually when it's needed. So there, there's important technology advances happening there. I understand in lakes there's always a certain amount of algae that should be present, but um, one thing I keep on hearing is that we should be killing off the toxic algae. But given that this species uh, easily transfers into, from non-toxic to toxic, shouldn't we be tar targeting the entire species? You, you raise a really important question here. And, and some of the research that's being done by um, Dr. Stuart Ludson and, and his crew at Ohio State looks at how these harmful algal blooms impact the aquatic food chain. And so what he's seen is that as you have more of the harmful algal blooms, it's, it's basically an energetic dead end or, or a, an end of the food chain because not many organisms will eat those because they're toxic and, and fish aren't evolved to eat those. And as we have more of those, we have less of the good algae. And so the research that he's doing shows that as we have these harmful algal blooms, we could potentially have less sport fish and things like that in Lake Erie. So we see the balance shift from kind of the good algae that the fish can eat to the bad algae. So the thought is, as we, as we can limit the amount of bad algae or the cyanobacteria, the harmful algal blooms, we can get some of that good algae back, increase the amount of good algae, and have more of, more of the fish that we like to catch in Lake Erie. Yeah, yeah some of these, these interactions between different organisms, for example, uh, uh, zebra mussels have been shown to preferentially eat the, uh, the non-toxic algae and to reject the toxic algae. Right, and so that tends to amplify the problem. Um, in addition to that, there are both toxic and non-toxic strains of the same uh, genera or the same species of these organisms. Uh, the good news is from an evolutionary standpoint, the toxic strains need to be, seem to be uh, decreasing in, in abundance. Uh, they're, they're losing the ability to generate these toxins. Uh, you know, if we can figure out a way to speed up that process, maybe that solves the, the problem for us. So uh, maybe the solution to it or part of the solution to it will be to figure out how to, um, to modify these organisms so that um, they become less toxic. Right? So uh, there's a number of different angles that, that folks are trying to think about in terms of those things. 
uh, you know, may not be entirely science fiction to, to think about something along those lines. Right, thank you. Um, earlier, I uh, heard you guys talking about uh, a, or, um, around a, a subject of like looking towards nature for solutions that have already been proven. So, um, how do you think that biomimicry, like what are, um, how do you think that biomimicry can s scale up to this large of a problem? I'm not sure where to go with that one. I'm not, I'm not sure where to question. go with that well, one. I, 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 maybe to rephrase it, is there anything naturally occurring in nature to, that, that nature's responding to this you know, invasive species and dealing with on its own? Uh, is anything already happening? And his question is, can we you know, inject that and make that nature act faster, bigger, better, stronger I, in some way? Yeah, I, I think there are, and I'm, I'm, I think you have a good question. I'm glad for your explanation of the yeah, question. Thank you. Um, I think one of, the, one of the management practices we look at are constructed wetlands. And, and why, why do we look at wetlands? Well, naturally, wetlands are sink for nutrients. They have, the, they have an anaerobic and aerobic interface, and that's a lot of scientific jargon to mean that they can actually remove nitrogen from water. They can pull phosphorus out of water as well. So earlier we talked about restoring riverine wetlands. That's actually restoring a natural system because that natural system can purify water. So that, that's one way that we are using natural systems to address this problem. Well, Thanks. and also some of the green infrastructure practices want to mimic nature, want mm -hmm. to mimic what we see in wetlands or in forests, mm -hmm. where the water, instead of, say, running off concrete, would infiltrate into the ground with porous concrete, which is permeable pavement, or like with the rain gardens. I mean, the idea is to mimic nature so that that water doesn't run off, but it's stored and then slowly infiltrates into the ground. Thank you. Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have you know, about 15, 20 minutes left um, uh, to talk about a couple things. One is uh, future innovations, and we touched a little bit, uh, uh, the student, uh, there he is right there, asked about, no, the one next to you. <laughs> him. Uh, he asked about technologies, things that are forthcoming. Uh, we addressed that a little bit, but are there other innovations, be they in, in the equipment that's being used? We talked a little bit about drones and, and miniaturizing some of the instrumentation. Uh, we, we talked about some of the advanced techniques that are forthcoming. Anything else? Uh, anything else we should anticipate in the next decade uh, that's going to address this issue that we don't see today? One thing I'd like to mention is real-time microcystin detectors. Yeah. So, so right now, when we take a water sample at a drinking water treatment intake to find out exactly how much microcystin's there, we, we, send off, then we send that off to a lab and it takes hours, uh, maybe tens of hours to get that result back. During those tens of hours, that drinking water treatment plant still has to provide water to the citizens. So it's kind of flying in the dark to know how much carbon, how much charcoal to add to that water to treat it. If we could have a real-time microcystin detector that you could put in the water and it could tell you what's in there right now, it would be a huge advantage um, for public health and drinking water especially. Uh, we are doing research on that at Ohio State right now. And so I think much sooner than within a decade, probably in the next couple of years, we'll have a real-time microcystin detector. That, and that'll really help us as we provide safe drinking water. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. One of the things that we're, we're seeing with, uh, with monitoring technology is really moving towards um, real-time kind of applications. So um, there are a number of different ways to, to try and identify the, uh, uh, the <coughs> toxins, for example. Uh, one of the approaches uses immunological responses. Um, those are assays. Um, a second type of approach actually um, analytically quantifies the, the material by, by looking at the mass of the, the compound or some other characteristics that's related to its, its physical composition. Uh, we're now starting to see instruments that are being deployed in the marine environment or in lake environments that have those capabilities built into them. So they can collect a water sample and have uh, kind of a wet chemistry lab that's deployed right there at the site of, um, of collection so that you can generate results and have that telemetered back to the, to the scientists at the, the port or at their, their lab so they can analyze the, the data and tell you, you know, what the risks are. So, so real-time technology is becoming very important. 
Kathy, do you see? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, another thing that, that hasn't been mentioned yet and is a huge source of the nutrients are CSOs, or yeah. combined sewer overflows, which many of our older cities like Cleveland have. And these are huge tunnels where the sanitary sewer water is combined with storm water when we get some of these heavy rains and then that combined sewer and uh, storm water is dumped into the lake. So you know many times um, like Edgewater Beach or Euclid Beach might be closed because of high bacteria levels and that's usually after a heavy rain and that's because that sewer water is being dumped right into the lake which is right by your beach. So the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has a plan in place that will cost billions of dollars, which gets to the, the funding, and it also gets to political incentives. But what they're doing are putting in massive tunnels, um, and you may see some of the construction around, it'll be going on for the next 10 or 15 years, where they're putting in huge tunnels to separate the sewer water from the storm water. And in these tunnels, they'll be able to store water until that rain and that storm passes, and then that water can be treated before it's sent back into the lake. And so that's something that we're all looking forward for the future. Right. And, and, and I think to, yeah. to build on that a little bit, so w one way to reduce the CSOs is to build these large tunnels underneath our cities, and we're doing that in Columbus as well. Uh, but going back to some of the other projects that Kathy's working on, and I'm working on at Ohio State, are rain gardens and um, permeable, permeable pavement. So one, one thing we can do is we can use the current infrastructure we have, which takes storm water and quickly collects it, moves it to the, to the river. But instead of moving it to the river, we can move it to these tunnels. Another approach is to try to hold that storm water on the landscape as a natural system would, going back to the idea of biomimicry and natural systems. And so that's really what rain gardens and permeable pavement do, is they allow us to hold that water on the landscape and let it slowly infiltrate through the soil so that the natural system can remove those pollutants and store that water. And actually we can recharge our aquifers that same way in the long term. So going back to a natural solution can complement these tunnels. That's what we're doing in, in Columbus. We have the tunnels, but we're also building, we also have an ambitious plan to build hundreds of rain gardens in Columbus right now to hold that water on the landscape. And when we do that, we can limit the amount of combined sewer overflows. We can limit the amount of pollution that goes into our rivers and lakes. Uh, are there residential applications uh, for rain gardens and permeable pavement? Is this something we, uh, can I put in a permeable, permeable driveway? Is that something available to residential customers or is it only big you know, roads and highways? That <coughs> no, a absolutely. Um, uh, you can put in pavers rather than, than concrete, for mm -hmm. example. Um, you can put in rain gardens in your, uh, your, your front yard. You can put in rain barrels. You can connect your downspouts to a, a rain garden rather than letting them run off into the, the system. So there's, there's lots of ways that we can each uh, be a part of this uh, rather than just expecting the solution to come from, from some larger um, you know, entity, whether it be the government or, or um, you know, industry. Um, in addition to that, there are also uh, local companies in the area that are working on technologies to try and strip nutrients out of, uh, of rainwater. Right? So uh, these are uh, some of the companies that are part of the Cleveland Water Alliance that are uh, developing technologies to try and remediate the, uh, uh, the water before it gets into the lake. And so that's, that's another uh, approach that's being used. Great. So with the time we have left, I just uh, make it, you know, deformalize the conversation, actually just talk about each of you. Um, how did you get into this work? How did, you know, when you were high school age, you know, what was your path to where you are today? What, what drove you to the work that you're doing today? So Joe, we'll just start with you and Great. back our way to Kathy. Well, I, I grew up on the East Coast on Long Island. And so I, I grew up at, um, you know, at a, an early age knowing that I, I loved the ocean, I loved the sea, I wanted to do something having to do with, uh, with the environment. Um, um, and so that's really shaped and, and influenced um, where I, I put my research infrastructure. Um, I went off to, uh, to my undergraduate school 
in New England and started uh, getting interested in climate and paleoclimate studies, and that's where I learned these techniques that I now apply to remote sensing tools. Uh, from there, I went to, uh, to the West Coast and was able to see how people do things differently on the East Coast and the West Coast in terms of private and public lands and, and mm. so on. And so that had a real big influence on me. And then finally, um, I went back East again to get some additional uh, training at Columbia University and ended up here as an assistant professor at Kent State. And so I wanted to start finding opportunities to bring undergraduates um, out into the, the lake because that's kind of like my personal ocean, right? I'm not right mm -hmm. next to the sea anymore. So, um, so we started going out there and, uh, with uh, research experience for undergrads programs, uh, working with Stone Labs from, uh, from Ohio State University and Ohio Sea Grant. And um, about those times, uh, we started seeing the development of these harmful algal blooms, uh, or at least the intensification of these harmful algal blooms. And that brought me into um, trying to figure out solutions to these problems. Um, and, and increasingly, I've been working very closely with NASA as a result of that. Great. Jay? Uh, well, I, I started my college career in an engineering program and eventually um, got graduated with a degree in civil engineering. Um, towards the end of that degree, I did take a couple of technical electives in ecology and realized I was really interested in ecology. I liked the engineering, but I was interested in how the natural world worked as well. And so for my graduate work, I focused on ecology. My PhD was actually in oceanography, uh, but I worked more on coastal ecology in Louisiana, and there I worked on bringing together engineering uh, methods and ecological methods so that we could understand how the management of the Mississippi River would affect land loss and salinity and fisheries off the coast of Louisiana. So there I started to bring together these engineering and, and ecological methods to try to answer these interdisciplinary questions. Um, after that, I came to Ohio State um, as a professor, and I've been at Ohio State for about for 16 years now. Um, I, I do a lot of work on what, what I might call smaller scale projects, looking at rain gardens, looking at constructed wetlands, how they can be effective to reduce nutrient runoff from a particular farm or from a particular lawn. And I've done work with rain gardens in residential areas like you asked about before. That's definitely an application for rain gardens. While, while I was doing that, I also kept, kept up the, uh, the ecological modeling and the, and the engineering modeling, looking at interdisciplinary problems on Lake Erie, uh, looking at a little bit at invasive species and then as harmful algal blooms, as that became more of a focus, um, I started to apply those models there. What, what's been really interesting for me in the last um, five or six years has been not only looking at the ecological and the engineering side of things, but looking at the, the human side of things, so looking at changes in behavior. So trying to understand not only what, what um, management practices are most effective, but what is likely to be adopted by farmers, what cultural um, factors impact what things farmers will adopt, or what economic factors will impact what things farmers will adopt. So trying to bring together not only the, eco the ecology and the engineering, but also bring in the social side of things to understand these, these complicated problems. Neat. Kathy, how did you get into your line of work? Not very directly. <laughs> um, I started my career in zoological parks and natural history museums, um, mostly with a focus on international conservation, working with monkeys in Africa is where I started. Um, then about 10 years ago, I moved to Cleveland and started work more regionally on conservation of natural areas through a consortium called the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership, or LEAP, which is a consortium of 50 conservation organizations in the region working together to preserve our natural areas. Um, and then it was through that work that I learned about the Office of Sustainability and was very excited to be hired on a couple years ago to work more locally and regionally on conservation and sustainability. Great, all right. Well, if any of you have the last, uh, last question, please feel free to ask it now. We have a few minutes. No? Okay, fine. Well, um, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause for a great conversation. Thank you.
So just to recap, we obviously talked about the context of what are harmful algal blooms, where do they come from, why are they happening in Lake Erie and really across the, the world. We then talked about solutions that people are working on. Many of the people you see up here today are at the forefront of a lot of this work uh, nationally and internationally. We talked about some of the challenges that uh, uh, they have with respect to finding those solutions or getting the buy-in uh, of various stakeholders and partners and, and making these solutions happen. And finally, we talked about you know some uh, future innovations that are going to be happening as well as uh, the background of uh, the individuals here and, and how they got into their work. So again, thank you so very much for your comments today. Thank you to all of you for really, really insightful questions. Uh, you're all very, very smart um, <laughs> people. Questions I, I couldn't have even begin to start with, whether it was biomimicry or the economy or any of those kinds of things. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and we are adjourned for today. So thank you. Thanks. 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 <coughs> Thanks again.